Hello, uh, good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. My name is Anna Sutton and I am a professional tutor on the Level 5 course with the BDA. And I'm really pleased to be able to contribute to Dyslexia Awareness Week with our theme of being uniquely you this year. I'm an experienced teacher of over 23 years in mainstream education as a class teacher, head of drama, specialist dyslexia teacher and assessor, and SENCO at both primary and secondary education. My special interest is in creative literacy and drama as a learning medium. And that stemmed from my BA degree in drama and English at Loughborough University. And I followed it up some years later with a, an MA degree in education at Cardiff Met. I've led many creative projects in primary education and linked with local theatres and conducted research into how drama can stimulate learners with dyslexia to access literacy and comprehension. I provide specialist teaching for students, training for teachers in the school setting, for the BDA, and at postgrad level for universities in the UK. I'm passionate about dyslexia-friendly teaching and investigating how best to support and empower learners to achieve their full potential. And I really hope to share some of this experience with you this evening. So now I believe we're going back to Claudia for the results of the poll. Ah, interesting to see that we have 66% uh, from primary education this evening, 20% from secondary, 8% from higher or further education, and 6% from the adult or, or workplace setting. Um, the webinar has been designed for, for all age groups, so I hope that you'll be able to take something from it. Okay. Um, so now we're going to go to the presentation for this evening. Just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint presentation here. So this webinar, is designed for um, teachers and educators. It considers individuals with dyslexia from all age groups, starting with what it's like to be dyslexic in the learning environment, advice for the educator, and a resource bank of key techniques and approaches. This also includes some techniques for life skills and appreciating the uniqueness of the dyslexic individual. Many of the images and techniques have been selected from my own professional practice and collaboration with other teachers over the years. So they have been tried and tested, although I have to confess their origin is not always known. So what is it like to be dyslexic? Let's consider how dyslexia is currently defined. A widely accepted definition of dyslexia in the UK was produced by the Rose Review in 2009. Although please note that a new definition is soon to be announced and it's currently under review. Definitions inform screening, diagnosis and intervention. They suggest how to spot signs of dyslexia and prompt us as educators to reflect on how to adapt our teaching methods. So Rose states, dyslexia is a learning difficulty that primarily affects the skills involved in accurate and fluent word reading and spelling. This may be evident for individuals with dyslexia of all ages, thus being a lifelong challenge. You may observe that a learner's written work doesn't reflect their oral contribution in lessons. Reading progress might be slower than their peers, stilted and lacking in fluency which in turn affects comprehension, as effort is put into decoding the words. One word may be spelt in several different ways. The individual may be a good talker, but often struggles with word finding or requires additional time to process new information. 
Rose also states that characteristic features of dyslexia are difficulties in phonological awareness, verbal memory and verbal processing speed. Well, this statement indicates that there are cognitive reasons underlying the literacy difficulty in the way the brain processes information. Phonological awareness is the ability to identify the sound structure in words and um, skills such as hearing rhyme, detecting syllables, um, onset and rhyme and sounds in words. Verbal memory is the ability to remember verbal information and verbal processing speed is being able to retrieve known information from memory at speed. Working hard at this brain-based level to access information and perform everyday tasks may result in fatigue, disorganization, or a feeling of being overloaded. Rose also states that dyslexia occurs across a range of intellectual abilities. It is best thought of as a continuum, not a distinct category, and there are no clear cutoff points. As educators, we are always looking for that potential to learn that might present itself uniquely. Sometimes stripping away the literacy barrier can uncover the most amazing talents and strengths. We also appreciate that dyslexia can present itself on a scale of difficulties from mild to severe so that each individual with dyslexia may have their own unique learning profile. Co-occurring difficulties may be seen in aspects of language, motor coordination, mental calculation, concentration and personal organisation, but these are not by themselves markers of dyslexia. More often than not, you may be working with individuals who display characteristics of other specific learning difficulties in addition to dyslexia and you're probably familiar with the umbrella term of neurodiversity. So is it the same for everyone? Rose states that a good indication of the severity and persistence of dyslexic difficulties can be gained by examining how the individual responds or has responded to well-founded intervention. As teachers, the first stage of intervention is to adopt dyslexia-friendly teaching approaches in our everyday practice. Intervention can come along in all different forms, but always consider the individual when selecting these. The BDA has produced an additional definition to complement the Rose Review and acknowledges that difficulties of a visual processing nature um, can affect some individuals with dyslexia. Now, visual processing is not really related to eyesight, which is why an optician may not be able to detect it. It is concerned with the processing of visual information. So the printed word can become difficult to process, thus affecting reading speed and accuracy. The BDA also acknowledges the importance of recognising and celebrating strengths and talents. Individuals who have dyslexia have learning differences and can show a combination of abilities and difficulties that affect or impact on the learning process. Now, we're really interested in the strengths that our learners display. Um, this, this could be in areas such as design, problem solving, creative skills, interactive skills and oral skills. And I think for inspirational dyslexic individuals, I'd love you to uh, just have a quick look now at our BDA ambassadors who have been um, sharing their work and stories with us this week on, on social media. So we have a whole range of inspiring people um, who act as our ambassadors. Uh, just for you to have a quick look through, you may recognize a few. So we've got fashion designers, actors, musicians, rugby players, we've got a vet here, uh, even the Royal Butler. And you can check this out on our website at any time. It is um, a, a page that's constantly growing, which is really exciting. Okay, 
So now it's time for you to enjoy a video clip that features individuals with dyslexia recognizing the superpower they have or would most like to have. Dyslexic superhero. I'll be called Red Line Man. I type all my poems on the computer, and all I get all the time is like Red Line, Red Line, Red Line. Super speller, and I'll be able to scan through documents, instantly zap it, and correct it with my eyes. I would be Computer Girl, so I could put on paper or anywhere exactly what I was thinking about at any time. Ooh, if I was a dyslexic superhero, um, okay, so uh, I'd probably. Um, I would be helicopter girl and I'd be able to instantly go up to a helicopter height and be able to view wherever I'm want, need, wanting or needing to go from above so that I can quickly find out where to go because I get so lost. My name would be... Uh, um, God, Ed. I would be book girl and I would go around finding books and I would creatively respell all of the words to make them much more interesting. Focus girl and I would be able to focus on things for a long period of time and actually get things finished. Uh, this is really difficult. I'd, OK, my name would be, be, be something like... Probably super filer, and it would be organisation. So I'd go around my room doing everything really quickly. Superman has the same power, actually. Captain Order, and my superpower would be um, I'd have a special wand and I would zap on people's desks and it helps to keep um, their day-to-day -day life at work uh, very organised. Cosmos. Some of them make life easier. The thing with me is, right, which is, if I change any part of me, right, am I growing up the way I am, I wouldn't be where I am now. And I've got fantastic wife, fantastic kids. I've just written my own book. And I wouldn't have done that if any part of me had changed. So I can either look at the bad parts and say, or oh, change them, but if I did, I wouldn't have the good parts. Dis dislex a lot. Captain Order. <laughs> she loves to organize your life. Captain Order. She takes out the trouble and strife. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And um, I, I just love that video clip. I think it really shows us, those of us who work in primary um, with school aged children, it gives us an idea of uh, what uh, our children will grow up to be as dyslexic adults as well. And that's on a website you can see that's called the Cod Past. It's really worth having a look. OK, so on with the show. How can we help as teachers and educators? Um, so on to dyslexia friendly approaches. So to appreciate the day to day experience of a learner with dyslexia, you're now going to hear a monologue about a fictional character called Bella. This has been put together from real life stories provided by uh, my own students that I work with. Bella is in year eight. She's been told that there are members of her family who are dyslexic. She wonders if this explains why she dislikes reading and finds spelling a challenge, although she doesn't really understand what it means. She's waiting for an assessment to find out if she has dyslexia. So here's the context. Bella is just moving into the fifth period of the day, which is a double science lesson. She needs to leave her current classroom, which is a short walk away from the science labs. And these are her thoughts. OK, so now I need to get to double science. I know it's science next because I heard one of the boys say it was. I'll just follow this group of girls in front of me. They always know where to go and I might just find my way. Oh, I found it. OK, so now where to sit? I find a stool nearest to me and next to Kate. She always knows what to do in class. Bella, don't forget you need to sit at the front. That is so embarrassing. I reluctantly grabbed my bag. I was hoping to stay by Kate. 
okay, so now what are we doing? Where's my book? Hopefully it's in my bag and not at home. Bella, can you get your science book out of your bag? I fumble around for it. Now what colour was the book? Green, I think. Or was that my year seven book? I have no idea where the book is. Aha, a green book. I use this. Bella, that's your geography book. Do you want some paper instead? Oh, okay, so I have paper. Now what are we doing, I wonder? Class, recall the experiment we did last session. Would anyone like to remind us what we did? Oh yes, I know this, miss. It was a fantastic experiment. We poured out the different liquids and then added a chemical ingredient which caused one of those um, actions, you know, a change. A reaction, replied the teacher. Yes, that's it. Oh, I love that experiment. Okay, class, so today we write it up in your books as a record. Make sure you use the terminology expected, use different colours. I expect clear labelling and well-written sentences explaining each step of the experiment. Off you go. Oh no, what did she say? Um, well, others are writing. Maybe if I look at the walls, I can get some help. Uh-oh, oh no, no displays. Hmm, something about different colours? I know, I'll find my pencil case. Hmm, what now? Oh, I know, date. Yes, I always have to write the date down. Maybe if I write slow enough, I'll be able to see what others are doing. Where is the date? Come on, Bella, we haven't got all day. Get started. But miss, what do I have to do? I'm sure uh, that, that uh, sort of last bit there is, is quite familiar to all of us. So now I'm going to read the same lesson uh, monologue to you, but with dyslexia friendly adjustments and reflect on what helps Bella with her learning experience this time. So we're back um, in this science lesson. Oh, thank goodness for my calendar app on my phone. It just pinged a notification to remind me it's science and to hand in my homework. That sign over there is some test tubes on it. It's got to be the way to science. I have a really good folder now with compartments in it and each book goes into one of those, which means mostly I can find things in my bag. Great, Miss has put out name labels and we're working in groups today. That really helps me to know what's going on. I really enjoy the experiments and practical stuff in class. It's great because we filmed last week's experiment and Miss is gonna replay it on the screen so we can remember the steps. She's provided us with some photographs on a sheet of the key moments. Oh, that's helpful. Oh, look, I'd forgotten that there were two solutions that we made. It's so difficult to remember everything the teacher says, but now we have a checklist and I can tick off when I've done each action. That does help me to remember. Miss stops the lesson sometimes for a check-in to make sure we're keeping up. I did ask her for some help with spelling the word reaction. She pointed out that we have our display in the classroom with key science words on. I am actually allowed to go up to the display, leave my seat and copy it down or take a photo on the class iPad to copy in my book. I've forgotten my pencil case, but there is a tub on the table with a range of colours. I can use those. Great. I can use the date stamp and ink pad instead of copying. I love the smell of the ink pad. I hate it when I don't finish in class and have to do it for homework. But Mrs. just said that she's running an extra session in tutor time tomorrow for those of us who want to can finish off. She's going to ask my form teacher if I can come. Great, that's a real help. That means I can go swimming tonight and I can't wait as we're preparing for a competition in my club. Thanks, Miss. I know what to do. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed listening to that and it, it gave you uh, lots of pause for thought. Um, I shared this with one of my students recently and her comment was, do you know what? That's exactly it. It is just the small things that can make such a big, big difference. And here is a summary of general day to day adjustments that can make the big difference. Um, trying to be inclusive and supportive having multi-sensory resources and equipment to hand, being pre-prepared and structured, regular breaks and opportunities for overlearning, 
um, providing different modes of presentation, giving that all important thinking time, um, adopting sensitive marking and feedback, and always thinking about self-esteem and encouraging that independence in our students and uh, creating those positive and vivid learning memories. Quite a tall order, I know, but a useful list to, to look back at and reflect on. So as teachers, how do we make our subjects dyslexia friendly? Well, at the heart of it is active teaching and learning experiences. And what are these? Well, it's integrating study skills and metacognition, which is um, trying to teach our learners to learn about learning, really, uh, within our subject teaching. So it becomes quite multi-layered. And how do we manage this? Well, in our resource bank to follow, we'll be covering that, that shortly. Um, and I'm sure you're, you're going away now or sat there thinking, I need some time saving, but effective ideas as teachers I know are very, very busy people. Now, are you on your own? Well, to be really effective, a whole school or community approach is needed and is the most effective approach taking that collaborative approach, sharing good practice with other departments in your school or other teachers, accessing regular training and ideas, networking inside and outside of the school with other professionals, um, parent power, training your parents to use techniques to support their children, or um, if an adult learner, you might collaborate with a good mentor or friend. But at the end of the day, asking the learner what works for them is, is at the heart of the process. Okay, so ultimately as educators, we strive to get our learners ready to access learning, thus empowering them. So now onto our resource bank of ideas. So here are some aspects to consider when planning an inclusive lesson, which can be transferred to different subjects. The lesson starter is an opportunity to engage learners and consolidate or assess retention of previous learning in an active way. It also serves as an opportunity to focus that attention at the start of the lesson. As with Bella's experience, think about how the literacy barrier can be reduced so that access to the main concepts and themes are enabled. How will the learner be supported to apply knowledge and skills? And do you have all the equipment and resources ready? At the heart of a dyslexia friendly lesson is a multi-sensory experience. See it, hear it and do it with plenty of active learning going on. Often learners need to be trained how to use learning techniques, but it's also an opportunity to engage them in the making of resources providing them with that sense of ownership and customization over the activities and, and techniques. Um, so here's an example um, in this next video clip provided by Dr. Susie Nyman, who adopts multi-sensory approaches in her science teaching. And it really does sort of uh, give a, a quick idea of what um, a dyslexia friendly lesson can look like. Hopefully this, this will come up now. Don't buy another toothbrush until you see what this one can do for you. Using it only takes 30 seconds for a professional result. The dental industry the... is being disrupted by... The... There we go, just skip the ads. ladies this morning we're going to talk about multi-sensory teaching we're going to be teaching about the heart today for dr susie nyman more than 20 years of teaching science to non-scientists has taught her that a variety of colorful and interesting multi-sensory techniques is needed to help her students engage with complex information and the correct scientific language the students find science really difficult. They tend to be turned off when they first come into class. And so you've got to do it in a fun and exciting way. So I try to do multi-sensory techniques, i.e. using sight, smell, touch, taste, in whatever way I can. We're going to do the circulatory song and we're going to do a laminated question. Susie starts each lesson by outlining the structure of the session. 
Her students know exactly what to expect over the coming 60 minutes. We start off by singing the key words to a song, for example, if it's the heart, it's Michael Jackson's Beat It, and that relaxes all the students and they feel really relaxed about those key words to start with. What's this one? Pulmonary artery. Excellent. The next one? Pulmonary vein. Good. Left atrium. Next one? In the next stage, we quite often make a model, a very simple model, out of Play-Doh so that they can feel it. And recently, I've found some smelly Play-Doh that they really enjoy using. And so the red smells of strawberries, the blue smells of blueberries, the green smells of apples, and the yellow smells of bananas. So it takes the students back to their childhood, which then they start feeling safer about the subject. What they like is the commentary. When we're doing the heart, I say to them, for example, the atrium. It's the largest room in the Roman house. So they've got this hook. And what's really important for my students is that they can visualise something that they can then link back to what they've got to understand. Um, when we get to the valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve, I say to them, in Sainsbury's, you try before you buy. And they can all remember that. So then they can remember the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve. And by making giant mats on the floor and walking through it, they're more likely to remember it. Which then goes to the try before you buy. So we start with the tricuspid. So the tricuspid valve, which then goes here. And then we turn to the right ventricle, which then goes here. And the first and time I used the heart map with a boy, he said to me, can I do it again, please? I didn't quite get it. And he did it five times. And then he went back and taught all his friends about the heart and relayed all the different parts back to them so that they could understand it. OK, some really uh, lovely ideas there for creating vivid learning memories. And don't worry if, you know, if you're not a confident performer, um, you can dip in and just start to access the, the techniques that, are, you know, that you feel confident with and get the children, get the students to, to create these approaches as well. They love it. OK, so on to the lesson starter. Ideas for lesson starters or even consolidation activities within the lesson. An active starter via something like a game focuses attention. It provides an instant memory trigger, re-establishes the connection with prior learning or provides that opportunity for overlearning. And it can be quite a social event, played in pairs, individually or small groups. Games can be customised for all ages and subjects and played, well, I would say don't play them for more than 10 minutes, otherwise they can very quickly overtake the whole lesson because you're having so much fun. <laughs> Let's click on. Okay, so um, you can use flashcard activities with key vocabulary and play matching games, such as matching key terminology with their meaning or classifying concepts into particular groups. Uh, for example, at uh, the start of a maths lesson, you could play a game where you're matching fraction cards with their percentage and decimal equivalents on other cards. Um, dice games provide an interactive element and can be customized so that learners need to perform a quick activity for each number rolled. So for example, if you roll a number one, explain a term to your partner. Roll a number two, spell the word aloud. Roll a number three, think of a word with a similar meaning, etc. Word building games such as building keywords or subject specific words in a time limit with letter tiles are effective for revision and spelling practice. And there are quite a lot of um, online apps these days for quizzes like um, Kahoot's that can engage a class or a group very quickly. Oral games such as Just a Minute or Articulate, where a participant explains the term on the card or talks about it at speed for others to guess. Um, techniques such as interviewing a partner about the topic being studied in 10 questions. 
storytelling techniques, playing the part of a character who provides an eyewitness account of a moment in history or speaks the thoughts in a monologue. Act out a scene or a chemical reaction or instruct others to mime the sequence of actions and provide them with simple labels. Or just merely stimulate interest by objects in a treasure box or a picture stimulus or use apparatus from an experiment or video clips. It's about making learning tangible. In this photograph, a student cut up the storyboard version of Romeo and Juliet and organised the scenes into the five acts of the play as a reminder of the sequence of events before focusing on the key task for the lesson, which was an analysis lesson of one of the scenes. It was hands-on, it engages conversation and serves as a visual reminder and opportunity to correct any misunderstandings. All of these games also foster good study and organisational skills. They reinforce the topic and be, can be transferred then to a homework activity as well. So moving on to the lesson content. Keep the key dyslexia friendly principles in mind when planning how to deliver the content of the lesson. Allow enough time for new information to be taken on board and present this in different ways, such as providing time for discussion. Saying information out loud is proven to support with working memory and retention. Although I do appreciate it can get quite noisy sometimes. So um, adopting a, a shared signal within the classroom or the group that you're working with can be useful in, in that situation. So you're encouraging listening skills as well. So how do we ensure that learners with literacy difficulties can access new knowledge and skills? Next, I'll present specific strategies for reading, writing and spelling. So supporting reading skills, pre-teaching key vocabulary before reading a new text can be helpful. Supplying visuals and creating word banks such as the Volcano One Offset. Um, working in pairs and groups to research a new topic area or providing opportunity for shared reading or reading along with audiobooks. Consider supporting at word decoding level to open the gateway to reading and so that the curriculum can be accessed using dyslexia friendly font and reading material. Um, and there's a link to uh, advice on that in the references and links at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Supporting the text with multimedia or drama. Actually putting subtitles up on the whiteboard with video clips that you might be sharing and customising word banks and displays in your learning settings. Learners with dyslexia may require additional time to read through the text several times in order to access meaning. This technique um, can really help to provide a quick summary of the text on the first reading and it is active. It can be adapted for any ray, age, range or level of text. So you begin by using a highlighter. You highlight the first sentence or topic sentence of each paragraph in the text. Then encourage the student to read the sentence aloud, the sentences aloud, and write one key word next to each paragraph and then retell the key events. Um, so what the student has there within five to ten minutes is a very quick overview of the whole text that you're going to be studying or doing a comprehension um, task on, for example, and they know roughly where to go to access the information. And then you can develop the task for analysis type work after that. Techniques such as scanning for particular information can follow this activity too. Providing structured questions to focus inquiry and develop opinion can be effective. This technique is particularly useful for developing uh, character descriptions or even events. So provide the six W question words on post-it notes, cards, or on a key fob. Who, what, why, when, where, and how. Encourage students to invent questions. You could ask the questions or get them even to answer the questions, but it's about engagement. Um, comprehend in the text. This is a very uh, famous tried and tested technique 
called SQ3R. It requires skimming, scanning, and word by word reading. So S for survey. So at the start, get, get students to check the title, name of the author, date of publication, look at subheadings, are there any summaries? Then go to question, why am I reading this? What do I know about the topic already? Is it of interest? Do I need to read all of it? Read, read quickly for an overall idea or use the paragraph technique I've just explained, highlight keywords. Um, recall or recite, talk it through out loud, opportunity to explain it to someone else, or even write down key information from memory. And review, check with the original, how much did you remember? Were your notes useful? Did your partner remember something else? Do you need to add any missing information? And this technique um, has been developed as well into PQ4R, which is often used in higher education. And that stands for preview, question, read, reflect, recite and review. So it has the extra stage. And finally, um, the reading, teach how to proofread. We often assume our students can proofread. Um, but staging in proofreading step by step and taking the process apart or chunking it so that the learner focuses on one thing at a time rather than trying to find lots of errors all at once can be um, much more effective. So you can use the COPS uh, approach, looking for capitals, overall, punctuation and spelling. Read aloud functions on, on computers. Um, you can use a word slider, which is like a card where you cut a gap out of the middle of it just to access um, lines in the text or just uh, read through section by section. So we all want to enable our students um, to express themselves and often they may have lots of ideas, but when it comes to getting it down on paper, then a multitude of barriers can be experienced. As teachers, we need to strip back the complexity of the task so that each component part is staged in along a recognised structure, thus reducing overwhelm. In the first instance, consider different ways of expressing yourself. Is a written task the only approach? You could use PowerPoints, speeches, storyboards, comic strips, videos. Always check in with the learner and make sure that they're able to access their normal way of working. Perhaps they have an access arrangement such as a laptop, speech to text software or additional time. And um, very often they might require encouragement to use these or to be given permission to use them. And scaffold the writing process, break it down into steps, planning, organizing and writing. So this is why it's necessary to provide that all important planning time in our classes. Big picture thinkers may not find it easy to organize their thoughts. Perhaps they need time to brainstorm first via something like a mind map and then time to organize it into a structure. It might be that you only need to offer support with one particular step in the process, such as the organizing of the information. Physically moving parts of the structure around can be helpful. This could be keywords on flashcards or listing ideas and talking through them or using smart targets or steps, just as uh, KWL, as I've put on, on this slide above, can be effective. Here are some more visual and kinesthetic ideas for planning and organizing information. Ask your learners what works for them. It might be that they've been asked to describe a sequence of historical events and a flow chart might be a visual and accessible way to achieve this as they literally picture the information appearing step by step. You can see there's a, a few more techniques there that you may already be aware of that can be really helpful for organizing um, ideas. So teach how to structure Paragraph technique can be applied to a range of tasks, creative writing, responding to exam questions, writing a report. It's about making the paragraph a concrete thing. Sometimes um, it's referred to as the paragraph sandwich. So with this technique, select the theme for the paragraph, then encourage the learner to select a keyword to sum that paragraph up. 
Introduce that keyword in the topic sentence, the first sentence, then add three details in supporting sentences and sum it up with a concluding sentence. Secondary teachers often favour this technique, which like the paragraph structure provides clear steps for providing deeper analysis in a piece of writing. It's often called P, Peel or P-E-A-L. P for point, make your point. E for evidence, back it up with examples. E for explanation, explain how the evidence supports your point. And L for link, link to the first point or the next point in your writing. This technique is one of my favorites and is very successful. Um, it's a quick way of getting learners to get something down on, on the page and they're often pleased with the results. Create, organize, draft and edit. It's useful for summarizing short written articles or writing about a topic. First, you ask them to list all the keywords related to the topic they want to write about in bullet points, but don't let them go over 10. Next, organize them around into the order of retelling. Then select the first keyword in the list, say a sentence out loud containing that word and write it down. Then do the same thing for each of the keywords. It can work with, with five points, it doesn't have to be 10. Finally, ask them to edit and expand with any extra details that they want to add in. And it has a real positive impact because they can see 10 sentences in approximately 10 minutes written down on the page and it does get them going. So as teachers, what can we do to support spelling? Well, reflect on whether your setting has a sensitive marking policy. Are there displays of theme vocabulary and word banks available, like Bella mentioned in her science lesson? Teach spelling rules and mnemonics for tricky terminology. And this is where technology might be able to provide support with uh, voice typing or dictation functions, spell checking and the readback functions that are available or even a voice recorder to record thoughts and play them back to remind um, you know what, what to write down. Morphology is the teaching of words by segmenting and building them by morphemes or units of meaning. For example, training students to learn about the prefixes in, meaning coming in, and x, out, then following up with a word inquiry activity generates scientific and mathematical study. For example, you could have words like interior and exterior as interior exterior angles or inhale and exhale in respiration in science. It's a spelling approach that's transferable across subjects, developing spelling vocabulary knowledge and provides that opportunity for revision. So spelling tips, encourage careful listening and awareness of sounds in words. Say the word in an exaggerated way, such as wed nes day. Find a meaningful association between the pattern, the spelling pattern and a familiar item or shape. Give opportunities for multisensory writing of the word and practice little and often. So now we're on the final section um, of the presentation. And many of the techniques and study skills trained become lifelong and are transferable into other aspects of life. We also need to consider the holistic experience for our learners, just like Bella. Challenges in the day may relate to timekeeping, organisation and just getting to the right place. Teaching how to be organised can underpin success across all areas of learning. Modeling yourselves effective techniques, chunking instructions, um, giving help or showing how to file notes and their work, even on the computer as well as in their bags and desks, time management strategies and prioritizing. Many find it difficult to prioritize the most important thing and can spend oodles of time on something that's actually not not urgent um, and I use Eisenhower's principle in my own day-to-day -day work so you can look that one up but it's a, it's the grid below on the screen there it's a great way for um, prioritizing um, a list of tasks. Self-esteem, confidence and motivation are integral to successful learning. 
Learning these techniques across all subjects, not just in the study support lesson, encourages an awareness of how and when to apply the skills learned. So encouraging that positive mindset too. Um, techniques like the Pomodoro technique, working for 20 minutes, break for 10, repeat up to four times, and then give yourself a long break for 20 or 30 minutes is good advice for students when they're conducting revision at home. This is a new one I picked up a few weeks ago from a trainer called Eat the Frog. And it basically means that worst task that you keep putting off that you just are dreading doing sits on your desk like a big frog. Imagine it growing and growing, getting uglier and uglier. And what you've got to do is get it done first and eat that frog, get it out of the way. Um, keep active, look, listen, feel and do. Celebrate successes no matter how small. And look at mistakes as learning attempts to celebrate. Understanding how I learn best and why and sharing those learning stories between teacher and student. Technological advances are empowering us all as human beings every day. Here is a list of basic assistive technology to consider using if you have access to it. But the future of technology is extremely exciting and dyslexia friendly, as virtual realities and artificial intelligence is being developed appealing to the senses and offering immediate access to the written word. And I think we're all watching that space very carefully. So homework or home fun, supporting and offering training to parents and other family members can be highly effective. Um, encouraging them to give time at home to follow passions and interests. Um, these might be a future career path for our students. Managing time to create a balance between structured homework time and a chance to rest. And those good old fashioned board games provide opportunities to practice a range of skills, including those oral language opportunities. So to sum up this week. As teachers and educators, we may only play a small part in the longer learning journey. But as my student earlier commented, it is the small things, the small adjustments that can just make the biggest difference. Celebrate the dyslexic individual and continue to be amazed and fascinated by their contribution to our schools, workplaces and communities as they continue to teach us, the educator, about the complexities and intricacies of the learning brain and their unique contributions to our world. Thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar on Dyslexia Awareness Week. Um, you'll see that uh, we've got lots of free resources on the BDA website. There's great stories on social media, and we'd encourage you to, uh, you know, encourage all individuals with dyslexia to share their stories. And we're now going to go over to Bex, who's uh, going to help lead our, our Q&A session. But thank you again um, for your, your time and attendance. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Anna. I know I really enjoyed it. So I hope it was really beneficial to lots of other people as well who joined us this evening. So I'm going to kickstart with some of the questions we've had throughout the presentation. We've only got 10 minutes, but I do encourage anyone that has a question, please to write it in the Q&A box now and we'll try and quick fire get through as many as we can. So this person has said, how can we find out about the new definition of dyslexia? Ah, now I've only heard by word of mouth this week that it's not going to come out until the summer of 2024. When it does come out, um, it will be on the BDA website, I'm absolutely sure. So keep following the BDA on social media and you will hear about that update because we're all waiting with uh, bated breath for that one. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, this person has said, could you provide an example of multisensory writing, please? Oh, great. Um, you can have lots of fun with this. The simplest, cheapest way of doing it is to get a, a tray and put salt in it and encourage the students to write the words with their finger in the tray. OK, because the grains, um, you, you know, you can feel them quite coarsely and uh, it accesses those sensory pathways. So 
just before I go on and get too carried away, one of the reasons for multisensory learning is um, it's it's a quicker pathway to the brain for learning, um, to those neural networks to the brain. So that is the reason. So any of the activities um, I've suggested using letter tiles, anything that's hands on. Um, I once trained a, a group of year four boys with squirty water bottles to write on the schoolyard for spelling. And the headmaster came out in horror because he thought they were peeing on the yard with these squirty fairy liquid bottles. Um, I've used gym streamers. Um, you know, the list is endless and get the children and the students to invent them as well. Older learners um, writing on the iPad with your finger as well on on the um sort of paint sort of programs you can get on there um yeah the, the list is endless really <laughs> that sounds really good thank you um so we've got quite a few people asking um if you could clarify eat the frog eat the frog I know I picked this up from a coach she she's done coaching and training for a, a career and she said well you just got to go home and eat the frog and I said well what on earth do you mean and she said well it's that task you keep putting off that you really don't want to do it imagine it's like a frog on your desk and through the day if you don't tackle it this frog gets bigger and bigger and uglier and uglier so you have to eat it at the start of the day and get rid of it and it's just an analogy to share with your students that I thought was was quite fun <laughs> 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 um so this person has asked how does a weak verbal memory affect a dyslexic child okay so a poor verbal memory affects lots of things um when we're giving verbal instructions in class they often can maybe only remember one of those things. Um, so too much information all at once without a visual uh, to, to support it or to, to remind them can be overwhelming. For an older learner, note taking uh, demands that verbal memory. So you've got to remember what the person is saying and get it down on paper. So it's an aspect of working memory as well, really. So anything that's auditory um language uh sounds going in not I'm, I'm not talking about music i'm talking more about um language then that's given to you in an auditory way um they can't hold on to it for, you know for some dyslexics they can't hold on to it in their brain Perfect. thank you um this person has asked do you have any any resources to support year eight dyslexic student um to yeah. support their any resources to support year eight dyslexic student learning skills in revising? Sorry. In revising. Yeah. So um, I actually used to teach a year eight study skills class. Um, and that seems to be the age group where they need that. So flashcards, um, as I said, those games for flashcards for matching information up and moving the information around on the table can be really helpful. There are loads of fantastic um topic revision packs with uh, a, a company called Ochre Books and um, you can make very simple board games as well so if you give the students a board game and ask them to come up with um, facts that they've got to give the answers to or revise and you can have like uh, bonus cards in their trump cards or whatever treasure cards um, even a basic snakes and ladders game they can make it themselves and practice the, the revision of those facts that way um, and also BBC Bite Size has loads of um, stuff there to get started, but more importantly, to access like a glossary of that vocabulary that you need to revise with them. Um, but any of those oral techniques and drama techniques as well, where they've got to uh, recall the information on the spot or interview one another, all that um, will help to build those learning memories. Great, thank you. Um, so obviously dyscalculia isn't your speciality, <laughs> but we have had a few people asking if these kind of techniques can be transferable into dyscalculia. Um, I would, I can offer advice on um, dyslexic learners with a maths difficulty rather than dyscalculia. Um, and yes, these techniques can be transferable to maths um, for your dyslexic learner. Um, 
I guess with dyscalculia, um, that concrete approach is, is really important because you're building that concept of number. But for someone with dyslexia and maths, you have other things that impact their maths learning. So what happens is they often have a, a good understanding of the concept, but things like their working memory, slower speed of processing, remembering the steps in an operation can get in the way. So if you want to look at more activities for that, look up Steve Chin. He's the big guru in, in that area. And there's loads of fantastic ideas and approaches there. Um, Ronit Bird, her website's got loads of card games, math, just using playing cards for maths um, and make it hands on. Perfect. <laughs> Okay. Um, so this person has said, this is a compliment to you, oh. please could you let us know if your level seven dyslexia course will be face to face or on Zoom in the future? My level, uh, oh, I'm not sure about that. The BDA <laughs> level seven course is, is an e-learning course. Um, I, I uh, work with some of the universities on, on a level seven or a master's course, but uh, yes, the BDA one is e-learning, I believe. Yeah. Um, somebody else has said where can you get a dyslexia diagnosis from oh okay so that that is a very big question um everyone's situation is different depending on the age uh the difficulties you've experienced the area you live in and, and access to assessors so i would advise you contact the helpline at the bda first and they will give you that very specific advice um, and there's also a list of tutors and assessors on the BDA website as well. You could start there and look for someone in your own area that way. Great. Thank you. I think this will probably be our last question. But if we haven't got to your questions today, I would really want to encourage you all to head to our helpline. All their information can be found on our website um, and they will be able to signpost you and advise you and kind of do the best they can to answer your question as well. So this last question says, do you have any tips for teaching children where English isn't their first language? Ah, oh, uh, do you know what? Tonight, before we started the presentation, I thought I better get a question about that. <laughs> How am I going to answer it? And um, the first thing, well, I considered was, well, I'd have to go off and look at what that language was that they spoke, because different languages um, have different systems, don't they? They can be orthographic or phonetic. So you need to determine what they can do first. Um, if there's a dyslexia element in their first language, as well as in the English language, that might be um, the first place to, to sort of look to target it. But um, essentially, dyslexia-friendly approaches that I've mentioned today, all of these can be transferable um, to teaching students with English as an additional language as well, because basically it all comes down to communication. And if you can't communicate through the written word, You've got to think of other ways to do it. And that generally is through uh, the people in front of you and what you've got at your disposal. OK, right. Thank you. I feel like that's a really nice way to finish this Q&A and this oh. presentation. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending this evening. We hope you've enjoyed it. Maybe you've learned something. Um, you can always kind of share your responses on our social media channels and keep an eye out for the rest of the week during Dyslexia Awareness Week. So once again, thank you, Anna. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. And, and uh, good, good luck with all your dyslexia friends. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.